Coming up on Tech News Today, have Disney and George Lucas ruined the internet? We'll discuss that more. Also, cue up the Apple worries. That's an Eddie Q pun. And the EFF calls out Ubuntu. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, October 31st, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash TNT and get a copy of Brandon Sanderson's Legion absolutely free at audible.com slash Sanderson. And by American Express Bank FSB, offering a high-yield savings account, the perfect complement to help you reach your savings goals. To learn more and open an account online, visit personalsavings.com slash online savings. Member FDIC. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your iPhone, iPad, MacBook, or Android smartphones. Find out what your gadget is worth and get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today, Halloween edition. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zachter. And I'm Jason Halloween. Audio no. listeners missed the joke where Aya, as dressed as a policeman, takes off his shades and reveals he has glasses on underneath. That was... Well, it's more... I need the glasses. This is pretty freaking awesome. <laughs> Uh, this is the show we keep you up to date the most important stories in the tech world, starting each time with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feed. The official iPad mini reviews came pouring out today from the usual tech review suspects. Overall, reviewers felt positive, complimenting the design, the build, and the fact that it runs existing iPad apps pretty flawlessly. Criticisms centered around the screen resolution and the difficulty of holding it in one hand. But forget about iPads. Who wants to know how the Nexus 7 sales are going? Anybody? I do. I definitely oh, do. Google's Nexus 7 sales are good. Almost 1 million units a month good, says Asus Tech, the tablet maker, during their third quarter earnings call on Tuesday. If you compare that to Apple's third quarter sales of 14 million iPads, the number doesn't sound so great for the Nexus 7. But then again, Google's announcement of the Nexus 10 tablet and the Nexus 4 smartphone this week proves that the company is pretty confident they know what they're doing. And now on to me with the weather. I dressed up wrong for that, too. Hurricane Sandy is beating up the Internet infrastructure. The undersea cable Atlantic Crossing 2 faced sporadic issues. An outage in Manhattan affected a Swiss provider of IPv6 infrastructure. Also, the FCC says that the hurricane has taken down 25% of cell sites belonging to the U.S. wireless carriers and that most of the remaining cell sites that are operational are being powered by generators. The FCC warns that those operational sites could run out of fuel before electricity service is restored. Debates, sporting events, hurricanes, can Twitter take much more? Well, it did yesterday when Disney announced it would acquire Lucasfilm and all its properties and sub-companies for $4.05 billion U.S. in cash and stock. George Lucas expressed his intent to transition Star Wars to a new generation of filmmakers. He will stay on at Disney as a creative consultant for new Star Wars movies, the first of which, Episode 7, is set to come out in 2015. Microsoft's tiles are a ripoff. At least that's what Surfcast, an operating system technology designer, is claiming. In a complaint filed in a U.S. district court in Maine, Surfcast says Microsoft infringes one of its four patents by making, using, selling, and offering to sell devices and software products covered by Surfcast's patent. That includes Windows Phone 7, Windows Phone 8, Windows 8, RT, and unsurprisingly, Surfcast wants Microsoft to account for and pay to Surfcast all damages caused to Surfcast by reason of Microsoft's patent infringement. Kickstarter has opened up shop across the pond. The crowdfunding site is now available for use in the United Kingdom. Until now, you'd have to set up a Kickstarter account in the United States. Kickstarter says it has plans to expand to other countries soon. Rockstar has announced that it will release Grand Theft Auto V globally next spring for Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. The game will take place in the reimagined Southern California city of Los Santos and promises to be the most thriving game world Rockstar has ever created. At least that's what Rockstar says. Pre-orders will begin in early November. 
Walmart will start carrying the $99 Boxy TV set-top box at 3,000 locations across the U.S. Boxy's No Limits DVR was announced earlier this month and connects to a television set, has no onboard storage because it acts as a DVR through the cloud, including over-the-air television transmitted through Boxy TV's built-in antenna. The DVR capabilities will run customers $14.99 per month. You think 48 core processors are for fluid dynamics and linear algebra? Yeah. Intel wants to put one in your phone. Well, they, they want to put Let's all 48 in your phone. Well, they want to put the cores in your phone. I'm stalling because the news here is just that Intel CTO Justin Ratner says mobile implementation of 48 core processors could happen much sooner than the 10-year window predicted by researchers. Promises, promises. Also, the researchers have got to be pissed at having their deadline bumped up. Google's updated its iOS app with enhanced voice recognition. Now when you search, you'll get a much more Android-like experience. You won't get Google Now cards, but the app will answer you when you ask it questions about sports, weather, and directions. I played around with it this morning, and it's pretty quick. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the leading provider of audiobooks with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction. They even have magazines in there. They have newspapers. They have like the New York Times, Scientific American, stuff like that. Listeners of Tech News Today get a free audiobook of their choice to try out the service if you haven't tried Audible yet. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash TNT and get a free book. Any of their one credit books are available. Absolutely free. No obligation. Just download it. Try it out. Audiobooks are a great way to increase your reading. I read a lot more now that I can listen in the car. I can listen while I vacuum. I can listen while I'm, like, taking the dogs for a walk. Uh, in fact, I just downloaded 2312 by Kim Stanley Robinson, a science fiction book uh, set in 2312. But it's part of his Mars universe. If you've ever read any Kim Stanley Robinson, it's a, it's a great extension of that universe. Or even if you haven't, it's a good introduction to him. But that's just one book that you could read. There's all kinds of stuff in there across all kinds of genres. So go to audiblepodcast.com slash TNT. And then while you're there, get another free book, Brandon Sanderson's Legion, absolutely free. You go to audible.com slash Sanderson for that. No trial, no credit card required for the free book. That's audible.com slash S-A-N-D-E-R-S. O N, and we thank Audible for their support of Tech News Today. Joining us now to discuss the news of the day, we're happy to have Steve Kovac, Gadgets Editor at Business Insider on the line. And uh, good good to meet you, Steve, in introduced by Justin Robert Young. Uh, glad, glad to get to know you, man. Uh-oh. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, Justin's a good old friend of mine from college, so I'm glad to be here. Well, let, uh, we got lots to talk about, uh, and starting with the fact that uh, Disney announced the the breakthrough news that they have purchased all of Lucasfilm. Lucasfilm 100% owned by George Lucas, but it won't be for long. $4.05 billion, pretty evenly split between cash and stock, will be going into Lucas's pockets. He will remain as a creative consultant. And the other thing that I, I found kind of shocking was Disney announcing they are going to have a new Star Wars movie, Episode Seven, a sequel to Return of the Jedi in 2015. Uh, and they plan to do Another movie in the series, episodes eight and nine, uh, every couple of years after that. And the, and they say they, they plan to continue the, making movies, making TV shows, uh, all kinds of stuff. Obviously, from the tech angle, there's lots of things to consider there. Industrial Light and Magic, the visual effects studio, uh, is now going to be part of Disney. Uh, we also have LucasArts, uh, makers of, of a lot of the gaming uh, properties for Star Wars, or at least collaborative with other companies, they're going to be part of Disney now. Disney said in their call that they are going to continue to concentrate on social and mobile games uh, and that they'll treat console games opportunistically, uh, which means that they, they kind of said, we're going to license out the property to others like EA. That's not that much different from what LucasArts has done in the past, but LucasArts has been very much in control of the content. This sort of implied that maybe they wouldn't be as closely holding the reins in the future but steve i know we were we were starting to talk about this before the show what what's your overall impression good bad ugly indifferent i think it's good and i think uh, one thing you left out was um disney's relationship with apple um bob Iger sits on the board of apple and so there's a good chance we can start seeing some star wars content hit the itunes store we'll finally get those movies on our apple tv and things like that so that's one thing i'm looking forward to and the other is the fact that George Lucas will have almost no creative input in the new movies, so they might actually be good this time. 
Well, I don't know. He's a creative consultant specifically for the new movies. Now, granted, that implies that he won't direct them, which I know a lot of people right. are, are pleased to hear, but he's still going to be involved. I'm well, guessing. Well, today in a. Today, StarWars.com put up an interview um, with he and Kathleen Kennedy, who's taking over for Lucasfilm. And um, she essentially got the treatments for episodes seven, eight, and nine from Lucas. And they really made it sound like it's in her court now. She She's already sitting down with teams of writers, and they're hammering out the plots for the next three movies. So it seems like uh, Lucas is sticking around in semi-retirement, just kind of poking his nose in the door a little bit. But I really don't think he's going to have much to do with these movies. He's it, pretty much in retirement Jar -Jar. at this point. More Jar Jar, right? Exactly. In Definitely needs more Jar Jar. Of That's course. a consultant yeah, they'll, just... they'll ignore. They're like, wait, we hear you, George. <laughs> Why don't you sit over there, go on store tours a couple more times, and we'll take care of this. No, see, if they're really smart, the first movie opens with a scene of Jar Jar getting killed off. Then everybody will buy into the future of the <laughs> franchise. How, how very Disney that would <laughs> yeah, be. Totally. Actually, it is. I mean, am I the only one who's just like really mad about this whole thing? When it comes to the movies, every single time George Lucas decided to rewrite one of the movies that I loved as a children, I hated him a little bit more. So now he just gets a huge pile of money to sort of step back a little bit, but maybe not all the way. And now we have three more movies that. I don't know. Maybe some people asked for them, but I think for the most part, it's like just you're just screwing it up. You want money. You want to make a bunch of dumb toys to put in Happy Meals and just stop messing with my youth. Well, <laughs> and, and, and th that is a reaction a lot of people have had, but other people have had a positive reaction for exactly the same reasons. They're saying, look, what this means is Disney can now do for Star Wars what it's done for the Muppets, what it's done for Marvel, which is be a very good custodian, and in Marvel's case, definitely improve the franchise, at least where movies are concerned. The other thing is, instead of Lucas going back to the well and keep messing with the old movies, we'll have new movies either to complain about or like. So let there be a new set of things to ruin other kids' childhoods, childhoods in like 10 years from now. How are we going to explain what Carrie Fisher looks like now, Ayaz? How are we going to explain that? All CG, all the time. Well, they're, they're probably going to set it far <laughs> enough in the future that it's... A siege player. Yeah, it's not It's not going to involve... If it involves Han Solo and Princess Leia and Luke, they'll be very old in, the, in these... I was sort I of think the more kidding, likely scenario but okay, place yes. After all that stuff. <laughs> There's no kidding with Star Wars. Uh, yeah, and back to what you said, Steve, I think we are almost bearing the lead, which is the idea that because there is a relationship with Apple, and it's easy to overemphasize these sort of board member uh, sharing, but there definitely is somebody who can do some talking and maybe get Star Wars movies uh, available on iTunes. Uh, and Disney actually might just be able to get Star Wars movies out in the channel generally in, in a lot of different uh, ways that Lucas has resisted up till now. Maybe we'll actually see, like, original versions of Star Wars prints put out in special editions and things that fans have been crying about for a long time. You have to think of all the stuff that um, that Disney owns. They own ABC, they own ESPN, they're a huge empire. Um, there's potential for children's shows on ABC, Saturday morning cartoons or something like that. Um, Disney is everywhere. You, anytime you see a new release for a Disney movie, it shows up on basketball games, on ESPN and things like that. You're going to see Star Wars everywhere now, not just not just on movies and on your Blu-ray or whatever. All right, uh, let's talk about Apple Fallout. Still a lot of uh, talk happening around the removal of Scott Forstall, his delay, uh, and and what that means in the executive shakeup. Sarah, what's what what are people saying? Well, you know, some of, some of this has to do with the fact that we just heard iTunes is now delayed until the end of November at the iPad Mini event uh, last week. A lot of people were hoping to at least get an update on iTunes, if not an actual rollout of the new iTunes that we had seen previews of and we had been promised in October. Obviously, this is the last day of October. It's not happening. We're supposed to get it in the next 30 days, which ties in nicely to the conversation we had yesterday where it was like, okay, Apple's now on a scheduled release uh, situation and that might not be working that well for the company. You know, maybe Forstall was not working that well with other departments uh, because of that. It's sort of the first evidence that we see that Apple's like, you know what, we're not going to have another Maps debacle. If iTunes isn't ready, then we don't release iTunes. Um, as you mentioned, Tom, there is quite a bit of conversation going on still about Scott Forstall being out and what exactly that means for the reorg that's happening uh, within Apple itself. 
and specifically with Eddie Q, uh, who is going to absorb a lot of what uh, Scott Forstall was uh, responsible for. By the way, now that the markets are officially open again, Apple is down uh, a little over $14, uh, which is not too, uh, it's sort of to be expected, but worth mentioning. Could be Lowest a little sell on the news July. sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, well, people are a little bit nervous. Hey, what's going on at Apple? Is this bad? Is you know, do they know what they're doing? Is this going to be good for everybody? You know, it's uncertainty really that's uh, that's affecting the stock price. Uh, as we talked about yesterday, Q uh, will stay in charge of iTunes, which, by the way, <laughs> iTunes is not beloved by everybody. I mean, even though Eddie Q seems to be pretty much beloved within the company, iTunes has its share of problems. He also gains Siri and Maps, so he's got the tough stuff. But uh, CNET had a really interesting article that uh, gave us a little bit more of an insight, or at least me, uh, as to Eddie Q's history with the company. He's been an Apple employee for 23 years. He started in the IT department when he was 25 years old. Um, and he's been in charge of iTunes since it launched in 03. And people really paint him as not, not only a ruthless businessman and negotiator, which he clearly is, but also a peacekeeper. He was sort of uh, the good cop to Jobs' bad cop. Um, he was also the one that is credited with spinning the disaster that was Mobile Me into iCloud, which is certainly less of a disaster, <laughs> even though it's still relatively new. Um, he was the one who's handled the relationships with book retailers, with the music labels, with the film production companies, um, so that iTunes and and all of our iDevices have good media. You know, we've got we've got all the good guys. He was the one who kept uh, Warner from pulling out when Warner wanted to uh, go to a month-to-month -month, uh, contract uh, with all of the uh, entertainment that they were uh, providing on to iTunes, uh, Apple sort of uh, with Eddie Q in charge saying, okay, well, you know, you know, okay, we can do that, but knows when to push back. Um, and again, that's, that's Q being the guy who's handling those relationships because he's good with people. So the landscape now is really interesting to me. I mean, they've got a lot of hardware competition that they didn't have just a couple of years ago, just even a year ago. Uh, they've got a lot of iTunes competition, streaming services. We've got the rumors of Apple trying to launch their own Pandora competitor, which is probably true because it's definitely eating into iTunes sales, which we hear are flat. At least that's what the record companies and, and, and the TV uh, networks say. And that iTunes doesn't really make a lot of money uh, for movie studios and TV networks. We've got ebooks that have been pretty tricky. <laughs> the U.S. Attorney General accused Apple of conspiring with publishers to fix ebook prices, which of course Apple denies, but They've, you know, they've, they've really got a spotlight on them right now. I think that people are optimistic about Apple's future. Certainly the, the fanboy people are. There's probably a little bit of schadenfreude going on too. But uh, I don't know. What, what do you guys think? I, I feel like knowing a little bit more about Eddie Q makes it seem like this, this all makes sense to me. I mean, he's got a lot of responsibility, but it seems like it makes sense for this guy to be in charge of iTunes going forward, Siri and Maps. It all, it all ties together. It's all made sense to me for sure. Uh, Eddie, Eddie Q is is the fixer, right? He's he's the guy who who comes in and, and polishes up things like Mobile Me and turns them into iCloud, which uh, let's be honest is not perfect, but it certainly works a uh, lot a lot better than than Mobile Me ever did. And iTunes does have its disadvantages, as you mentioned. I do think that what when we see iTunes delayed to November, that's almost a good sign that Apple is saying, look, we're not going to force something out there that is uh, incorrect anymore. We're going to make sure we get it right. Steve, what do you think of all this? And I'd like to see some bigger changes come to iTunes. What they showed us, um, when was it? Back when the iPhone 5 launched, it didn't really look that different. I mean, iTunes looks largely the same it did when it launched in the early 2000s with just a few minor tweaks to the UI. And the new UI doesn't look very useful at all. I mean, it's it's 2012 now. This the software is 10 years old or so. Um, it's time for a big refresh on it, and we're just not seeing that. And then going back to what you guys are saying about Eddie Q. I mean, yes, he has Siri and Maps on his plate now, but um, you also got to keep in mind he's part of the team behind um, working on Apple TV and working on all these content deals behind the scenes um, with these content owners and cable companies to make an Apple TV happen. He has a lot on his plate right now, and working with two products that are, you know, kind of like in beta right now, and then uh, the next blockbuster product, the TV, is going to be really busy in the next year or so. I wonder if the iTunes delay has anything to do with the fact that Forsall is out 
And then we have Ivan, uh, Johnny Ive in charge of all things human interface. We can get a much nicer looking iTunes because, like you were saying, uh, th it's not ex the new version of iTunes kind of looks like the iPad version because it's stripped out a lot of things. It's kind of dumbed down, which is supposed to be better because iTunes is a bloated mess, very difficult to use. Maybe with Johnny Ive in charge of this kind of thing, maybe this will be a lot easier to use and actually an improvement because iTunes, even though it's delayed, I mean, like, like Sarah was saying, like nobody really is like, oh, I love iTunes. Don't change it. It's like, no, do something with it, please, immediately. But yeah. at the same time, it's not as if it's like, oh, the iPhone 5 is delayed a month and people go, ah. You know, it's like this isn't this isn't a product that we don't already have. We have iTunes right now. A lot of people are hoping for something better. But I say, yeah, delay it until it's awesome. Then you roll it out and then you impress everybody because we still can use iTunes now. Yeah, I guess the risk is if you delay it till it's awesome and, you, and, and it's not seen as awesome, then people think, oh, well, you delayed it for what? Uh, so, so you kind of have to deliver on that as well. Let's move on to the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, publishing a post today criticizing Ubuntu's rollout of the Amazon shopping service in the da in the Unity Dash interface. Yeah, the post is actually, I think, about two days old, but a PC World did an article about it, and I somehow missed it. But the EFF is really irritated with the way Ubuntu 12.10 handles privacy. If you're unfamiliar, this, the search feature in Ubuntu called Dash will search for things on your machine, and it also added a search for online things. So searches will show results from Amazon affiliated advertisements and for other products. And it's turned on by default. Now, Mark Shuttleworth, uh, founder of Ubuntu, says, look, you're obviously safe. We have root access to your machine. You obviously trust us. You should trust that we're going to make sure that you're gonna, your, your data is safe. And when he says, I have root access to your machine, those of you who don't understand, Ubuntu uh, pushes the, uh, the kernel updates and the software updates to the machine. So it's not like Mark Shuttleworth has hacked into all of the machines. <laughs> you, you trust Ubuntu to push the updates. You're trusting them to have root access. And uh, the EFF went into some search basics done over HTTPS. So the searches themselves are encrypted, but the images are loaded using HTTP. So if there's Amazon products to display, somebody who's passively eavesdropping can actually see what images you're getting uh, for your search results. And even if the images were loaded via HTTPS, there's a fear that Amazon will correlate the images with the IP addresses because it's being served from Amazon directly. Now, Amazon isn't the only company seeing your data. There's some information in the uh, Ubuntu uh, Terms of Service saying that other third parties can look at your results, including Facebook, Twitter, and the BBC. Now, EFF, and we have a, we'll have a link to this in the show notes, has instructions on how to remove this and how to turn off search in, d in the dash if you want to. And there's like a plea at the end of the post saying, Windows and Mac users are used to having their data sent to third parties without their express consent. Let's make sure Ubuntu remains an exception to this. Now, Tom, you, you have, you're running Ubuntu 12.10 there. Is this privacy concern, you know, something that seems legitimate to you as a user, or is this some kind of like unnecessary, let's all panic? Uh, it seems overblown to me. Uh, however, I do agree with all of the points of the EFF article, which is this should be opt-in, not opt-out. I understand what Ubuntu is doing. They're making money off referral links, uh, and they provide uh, a lot of great guidance in, in, in the Ubuntu project, and they, they need to make money, and I, I don't begrudge them that. Uh, however, by default, having every search I make go to their servers and then head to Amazon. And yeah, we've got these images coming back. And if I'm, I'm searching my own hard drive for something, I'm still getting images back from Amazon. Granted, if I'm on an open Wi-Fi connection, I should be using VPN and, and taking proper security provisions. Uh, but that sh I shouldn't have to think about that when I'm searching my hard drive for the privacy settings app, which is actually, that's the way you turn it on. Yeah, press dash, type in privacy, search results will say when searching in the dash include online search results turn that to off i've left left mine on i'm going to turn it off right now actually uh because i i didn't really care it was disconcerting the first time i went to dash and i saw a bunch of amazon results in the more suggested underneath and i and i was just looking for g edit uh so and it's kind of weird the kind of things that come up when you're looking for programs like g edit uh but again, I don't think this is a horrible thing. I don't think it's a horrible thing that they might put in Twitter results and Facebook results as options. But again, I totally back the EFFs. This should not be on by default. This should be something that maybe Ubuntu encourages you to turn on because it's useful. But you should turn it on, not Ubuntu. Steve, what, what do you think about this? I mean, there's lots of different options when it comes to Linux. Ubuntu is really friendly, so a lot of people use it by default since it's so simple. Is this kind of feature like this underhanded feature, or is it actually somewhat innovative? Because maybe you do want to search on the web while you're searching around on your computer. Well, there's a balance you always have to strike here with privacy stuff. And I mean, um, I'm always a proponent of 
protecting the user's privacy by default. And that's why I'm really happy with like what Explorer 10 is doing by not enabling do not track by default. You know, that really makes a lot of advertising companies mad, but you know, Microsoft is looking out for the user. Um, other browsers, you have to turn that off. And I agree with what Tom said, you know, that should be opt in, not opt out. And it sounds like you have to go through a lot of walkie settings and things like that if you want to turn it off. Um, and that's just not looking out for the user's interest. It's looking out for your monetary interest. It's it's actually not that hard to turn off. You you press oh, okay. You press the 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 uh, the dash key. Uh, you type in privacy. You see that you can buy for six dollars and seventy eight cents privacy big ideas small books, which maybe Amazon should read. Uh, and then you can click on the privacy app, and it's one and it's the first the first thing that comes up in the privacy app, and it's one little switch. So it's not hard to turn off. It, you just shouldn't have to. It should be. I think it should be turned off by default. Exactly. And then Ooh, a privacy LCD screen for one cent. <laughs> yeah, that's it's just, it's just silly. All right, let's uh, take a break and uh, thank our other sponsor for today's show, American Express Bank FSB. If you're looking for savings, looking for money uh, to save for a house, for a car, for an emergency fund, whatever, you may think, well, you know, my bank does an okay job. It may not be the best interest rate. I, I, I wish I could shop around, but I, I love my bank. I don't want to change. You don't have to change your bank to get an Exper American Express personal savings account. Uh, whatever your goals for savings are, an Express personal savings high yield savings account gives you a competitive variable interest rate to help you reach your savings goal. And you can link it to your existing bank accounts without having to switch banks. Transfer money uh, depending on your needs. Keep track of your balance by phone or web. And there are no minimums and no fees, and you get great phone support whenever you want to talk to someone. So go check it out at personalsavings.com slash online savings. Take control of your finances today. Learn more about the American Express Personal Savings High Yield Savings Account right there, personalsavings.com slash online savings. Uh, while you're there, you can just open an account. It's pretty easy. There's no minimums, no fees, and you don't need to switch your bank. All you need to do is get started today. Let American Express Personal Savings help you reach your savings goals by opening a high-yield savings account offered by American Express Bank FSB. That's the high-yield savings account at personalsavings.com slash online savings, member FDIC. And we thank American Express Bank FSB for their support of Tech News Today. Walmart's going to sell the new Boxy TV box. It's a $99 box. Uh, we've talked about it before. It has the cloud DVR. Uh, and starting tomorrow, you'll be able to walk into 3,000 Walmarts across the United States and pick one up. Now, is this going to appeal to the Walmart crowd? It combines broadcast channels and internet video. So the big plus here is when you take it home and plug it in, you immediately see TV. It's got a built-in antenna. Probably works better if you add an antenna to it, and you're going to get better reception. But it's got a tuner in there. Uh, and if you're in one of eight cities, you can take advantage of the No Limit Cloud DVR. Record unlimited TV to remote servers uh, from, that you can then access from your smartphone, from your desktop, from your laptop. Those eight cities are New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, Philadelphia, and Washington. It costs you $15 a month. So if you don't want to pay 15 bucks a month or you're not in one of those cities, when you get this thing home, you're going to plug it in and you're just going to be able to stream live TV from over the air or from one of uh, the apps. I mean, they still have the, all the apps you know from Boxy TV, Netflix, Vudu, YouTube, Vimeo, uh, but you will not... Uh, be able to pause live TV on this thing. You don't plug in a, uh, a hard drive like you do with, a, say, a simple TV or something like that. So I I don't know. What do, we, what, do, do we think that this is actually something that folks will walk into Walmart, see this? I mean, Walmart's going to make a big deal. They're going to put it up on the end caps of, of aisles. They're going to do some marketing for it. What do you think, officer? Well, well, let's see. Let's see. So we have Walmart selling the Boxy TV exclusively, by the way. There's a retailer. This is the only place where you can get it. You can buy it through Boxy right. directly, but, so it, but retail. Brick and mortar, yeah, you're yeah. going to be going to Walmart for this. Now, I think as far as Walmart is concerned, it's how are they going to push this device? I think that they're not going to necessarily say, yeah, you can watch TV on it. And yes, you can, put a t you can add that little antenna that is included in the box with Boxy TV. I think Walmart's probably going to be like, hey, by the way, if you don't get reception, use that Voodoo service, which we happen to own, which has happened hmm. to be on that box. It's only 90 something dollars. They have it built into a lot of the, the house brand televisions. So I, I don't think that the Walmart employees are necessarily going to be pushing it as a cloud DVR system. Likely, I'm thinking they're going to say, oh, yeah, it's got some TV stuff, but you should try Voodoo because that makes us money. Steve, what do you think? Is, 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 th this has got some good things to recommend it with the live TV built in. Yeah, I actually got to stop by Boxy's office a couple of weeks ago to see it in action. They gave me a demo and everything. And 
as great as it sounds on paper, I think it's only going to appeal to a really small subset of people that, you know, the so-called cord cutters who don't uh, subscribe to cable anymore and get their TV over the air and through all these streaming services. Because if you have cable, you can't take advantage of that cloud DVR service, no matter even if you live in one of those cities, you, you can get some basic cable channels like, uh, but you can't get um, AMC and HBO and you can't record those kind of shows. So I think it's going to be a very narrow audience for this device, even if Walmart is really touting it on an end cap and every store and saying you get voodoo and all this stuff. Um, the core cutters are really going to be the only people who dig this thing. Well, and and you have to know your connection well. I mean, the, if the, with this cloud DVR service, if you do want to pay for it, you're going to have to have a good uplink connection to be Correct. saving all this money. And that's going to, if you've got bandwidth caps, that that counts against your bandwidth caps in a lot of cases. So you're going to have to have good bandwidth and, and you're going to have to be able to keep track of it and understand that. I'm not sure that the average person walking in off the street really considers all of those things when, when they see this kind of device. It is the right price. I mean, it's right, right there next to an Apple TV at $99. Roku's boxes are a little cheaper, uh, but they also don't come with a tuner built in. They, they don't come with this live DVR service. So you get a little more for what you're paying for. Sarah, and you're talking. Oh, go, oh, go ahead, Steve. Well, that DVR service um, also costs about the same as like if you get Time Warner or Comcast DVR service. They charge you about the same. So it's a pretty good deal for that. Um, the only problem is, like you said, the upload stuff and you're only getting live TV. Another thing that they let you do is um, kind of like Slingbox, you can watch your recorded shows on your iPad, on your MacBook or anywhere you go. So if once your sh uh, shows are uploaded to the cloud, you can watch it on any device. You're not just limited to the boxy TV. You can watch it in any browser. And Sarah, you're a cord cutter, so th does this something that would appeal to you to integrate into your system? Yeah, you know, I haven't had a DVR for a long time <laughs> because I don't have cable and I never had a DVR to begin with. I was sort of I, I, an old dinosaur holdout. But the whole $15 a month thing is hard for me to get my head around making sense. And that it's not because I don't think that DVRs are helpful. I think that a lot of people, especially when you cut the cord, you just simply have to be accepting that you're not going to have access to everything and you're a little bit more selective with what you're going to sit down and watch. At least that's been the case for me. Over the air antennas are great. I mean, I watched every game of the World Series. I had access to that. I mean, that's there there are certain live events that it's absolutely essential. And yes, I suppose if I had a DVR capability, I would take advantage of it sometimes, but I'm so used to not having it that it's sort of an expense that right now I don't have and it would be it's kind of hard to get myself uh, under the impression that I need it. I think a lot of people feel that way about DVRs or HGTVs, all sorts of stuff. You don't really know what you're missing until you have it. So I think, ah, oh, $15 a month, I don't need to pay all that. I'm already paying Hulu Plus. I'm already paying Netflix. I could probably do without it. That said, for somebody who's looking to cut the cord, I think the Boxy TV is a really attractive uh, solution. You got a $100 device, $15 a month for a lot of people is still so, so, so much less than what they'd be paying a cable company now for a lot of channels that they're not necessarily watching. And yeah, there's some bandwidth uh, issues to contend with, but it's a really great option. And I think you guys are all right. Walmart is smart um, to put this into the same sort of, hey, we've got all sorts of alternative viewing options um, in their stores. I as you probably just roll your own, right? I mean, because you could do all the stuff that Boxy is doing with a nice big terabyte hard drive in your house. You could do that, and that wouldn't have the same concern with the bandwidth, you know, up, upload and download speeds. But the thing about moving your files from a media center PC or a TiVo or your direct TV box or any of those things, trying to get that content off without using a special app that's blessed by some company, it's kind of a real pain. So the fact that BoxyBox has this hook as well, that cloud DVR, mm -hmm. to me, I could see that being a really convenient option, assuming you can get the bandwidth. So, I mean, I probably would try to make my own work, but I, it seems like it's a, it's a lot of heavy lifting to get those files from Windows Media Center to iPad to whatever other device you have. It's a real, real pain. Now, we here in the United States think of ourselves as very technologically savvy and, and getting the, the latest iPhone first, but the big market that everybody's eyeballing is China. Uh, and Apple has really, in some ways, bet their future on selling iPhones in China. They're a little close to having the iPhone 5 on sale there, right, Sarah? 
Yeah, I'll say. I'm sorry. I just had to go Apple heavy with the news today. I'm just feeling so Apple-y. Uh, but, you know, who, you would expect nothing less. Chinese yeah. news site Sinatech uh, reports that the iPhone 5 has been approved for sale in two different very specific versions. We have the A1429 model that will be compatible with China Unicom's 3G and GSM networks. And the A1442 model will operate on China Telecom's CDMA network. There's there's a lot of red tape. Apple has to pass something called uh, the China Compulsory Certificate or 3C certification. CNET's reporting that Apple still needs a network access license to allow the handsets to connect to the country's cellular networks. But we're getting there, at least as is being reported. Of course, China Unicom is the number two network in China, part owned by the state, 5% owned by Spanish uh, uh, mobile giant Telefonica, has 180 million subscribers, a little bit more than that actually. Then China Telecom is the number three network, which has over 110 million subscribers, but no approval yet for China Mobile, which is by far the biggest. It's a state owned network with more than 600 million subscribers. So a little bit of a, hey, what's going to happen with China Mobile? But if China Unicom and China Telecom are both on board, we're looking at collectively, I mean, not all of their subscribers are going to get uh, iPhone 5s, but the iPhone is a very popular device in China. Um, the previous models have sold really well. And according to Tim Cook, um, it, which he said this on the fourth quarter earnings call last week, China represents now about 15% of Apple's global revenues. Uh, and said that the iPhone 5 would arrive in China during the December quarter. So Apple sounds pretty confident that they're in, in China. Obviously, China, uh, China Mobile is a bit of a question mark at this point. But I agree with you, Tom. I, I, there, there's a part of me that thinks that Apple's sort of sitting around chuckling a little bit at what all the rest of us in the U.S. and, you know, abroad are saying because they really have their sights set on China. Um, if they sell a crap ton of iPhone 5s in China, a lot of what's going on in other markets becomes a little bit less important. And you know, we saw that big study about, I think Strategy Analytics and IDC did uh, quarter three numbers and saw that Samsung had like a, something ridiculous amount of phones being sold in the last quarter. And, I, and Apple was number two. That's without a presence in China with the iPhone 5. And once they get into that market, finally, that's going to be a huge amount of sales. I, I believe, I might be incorrect about this, but I think China Mobile is like the third highest, uh, the, the third biggest company. Yeah, it's the third biggest company. And that, if, if they can get that phone on a larger carrier, even though the third largest company in China is gigantic, I mean, it's got a billion people in this population. If they can get to a, a bigger carrier, they're going to be selling as many phones as humanly possible or can be made humanly possible, I guess. It's, it's, it's a very important market, and I think it's really going to make a huge difference once they get in there again. Steve, how important do you think uh, the China market is for Apple? I mean, obviously, just like Sarah said, it's it's huge. It, there's hundreds and hundreds of millions of people subscribe to these networks, and they're just dying for it already. And, you know, I live in New York, and I walk by the uh, Fifth Avenue flagship Apple store every day, and I see people every day paying cash for these iPhones um, and just to basically ship them unlocked over to China so they can sell them for even more profit. There is just insane pent-up demand for this. Um and we're seeing it here in the States alone. I can only imagine what it's like when the phone launches there. And then, you know, the what I'd really like to know is what's going on behind closed doors with Apple and these carriers and getting all these licenses. I mean, I'm sure the Chinese state isn't exactly easy to work with. So Apple knows the importance of this. So it's going to be very interesting to see how they work with the Chinese government, how they work with these carriers. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. I mean, the, the, that is a bureaucracy that is uh, very intricate to negotiate that's one of the reasons tim cook being the ceo is an advantage for apple because he has a lot of familiarity for managing the supply chain uh with how things work in china so it, it is a big advantage for apple there let's finish off with the build conference going on right now microsoft's mm -hmm. developers conference this is the second year it's been called the build conference they've been doing developers conferences forever uh what's some of the big news coming out of that well it's more it's, it's more naming things one of the this is this is based on something sarah said to me the other day I was saying it's either called Metro or Modern UI or something strange. I don't even know what it is. She called me out and saying, aren't you going to do a window show? Shouldn't you know exactly what it's called? Microsoft finally gave an answer. Tom Warren at The Verge actually asked during the Q&A session at Build, he asked Microsoft's Will Tashumi, what do you call Metro style now? Now, Metro is that design language. It's got the big text everywhere, squares, tiles, all that fun stuff. He said, quote, I'm not going to get into details 
of why we're not calling it Metro anymore, but we are calling the applications Windows 8 Store applications. And to Shumi argue that you could... <laughs> <laughs> but that's what they called the interface, the Windows 8 interface. Right, to Shumi also argued you could refer to the style as Windows 8 Store style. Now, back to this naming convention, Windows 8, uh, Windows 8 Store would, would refer to Microsoft's tile-based touch-first programs, which would run on Windows RT and Windows 8, which Microsoft has been saying for the longest time are not the same thing. So Windows 8 Store apps would run on Windows RT and Windows 8. So everybody got that? Now, Tom Warren's wondering, hey, look, the awkward name, Windows 8 Store Style, does this mean Microsoft doesn't want anybody to ever refer to the design language at no, all? No, it, it just means that they, they got uh, in legal trouble for calling it Metro, so they're, they're going to back off of that. Well, on, on OS X, the old design language was what, called Aqua interfa Interface, and nobody called it that other than developers. Sarah, what, what do you think of the name? Should the design language name matter anymore, or is this just ridiculous? I think it's a terrible name. Uh, but it's a little more Microsofty than Metro was. I, I guess that the problem that they Microsoft really had was, yeah, they've, they've got a trademark dispute. They've got to get rid of Metro, but they put a lot of effort into all of us calling it Metro. I mean, we still say Metro on the show, and then somebody else corrects one of us, you know, whoever says Metro. So it's like, okay, well, what does Microsoft do at this point? Come up with some other word that that, that sounds cool and designy. Probably not. A little late in the game. So why not just get really literal and say things like Windows 8 Store Style and Windows 8 Store Applications because everyone will know what it means even if it's not sexy sounding. And I'm sorry I just said sexy when talking about Windows, but it just happens. Steve, what do you think? I mean, th this style doesn't just go to Windows. It goes on Xbox. It goes on, well, it used to go on the Zoom. It goes on the phone. It, it, should it be called Windows 8 uh, Style Store, or whatever it's called, Store Style? <laughs> I don't think it matters what it's called. I think what matters is that they get developers on board and start making the great apps that the iPad and other rival tablets and touchscreen devices have. I mean, call it whatever you want. It doesn't, modern UI, Metro. The fact is that App Store is empty. I am, I've had the Surface for a few days now. I reviewed it yesterday. And I mean, there's nothing on there. There's no Facebook app, no Twitter app, no Dropbox. It's just missing a lot. And what they should be concentrating on at these developers conferences is getting the developers excited to make stuff, especially for Windows RT and Windows Phone, and not so much like people are concentrating way too much on what this design language is called. It doesn't matter. What what they need is a robust app store to really compete. Otherwise, people aren't going to buy these devices. I disagree that that the app store is empty. There's Netflix in there. There's third party Twitter apps in there. They, to me, it feels very similar to the way the iOS store felt when it first launched the the iOS app store. So there there's definitely things in there. Uh, but I, I definitely agree with you that I don't think it matters what we call it. And in fact, I don't think most people really care. They're calling it tiles. They call it Metro. Journalists want to get it right because they, they want to have the official name. Uh, developers want to have a common language that they can use when talking to Microsoft and not have the officials at Microsoft legally obligated to go, well, actually, it's not called Metro. It's, it's called the Windows Store apps. Uh, and and a couple of people in the chat room have pointed out that they misspoke when they called it Windows 8 store apps. It's Windows store apps, but I don't think that makes any difference either. Uh, whatever they call it, it's a tile interface. Uh, and 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 you're right, Steve, in the end, whether we can agree or to disagree about how empty or not it is, they need more apps. And they need more developers to get really excited about this. And to be f fair, Microsoft didn't acknowledge this as, as an issue until the Q&A session during a build uh, developers con uh, session, a conference uh, press event, excuse me. And th one of the things that, that uh, Microsoft is doing, this is a quote from Steve Ballmer saying, we're going all in with Windows, and that's why you guys should come with us. So uh, I, I'm thinking they're really, I mean, they're really focusing on the developers for the most part. For the rest of us, we're all like, what are we supposed to call these things? Because they, they're tiles, but they're the tile-based Windows new interface UI thing. <laughs> All right. I, I, <laughs> trademark. Let's, Thanks for clearing that up. Let's move on to the randomizer. I feel better. You're welcome. Randomizer. I uh, saw this on Engadget today. Uh, a missed linking book replica with a full PC inside. So if you ever played Mist, they have that book that you know has the moving pictures inside, and then you click on that to go into the world. Uh, this is a, a a book with a Windows XP PC with a 1.6 gigahertz Atom processor, two-hour battery, five-inch touchscreen, and every playable game from the Mist series stored on a CF card. Uh, so those of you who hate Mist are just gonna hate this even more. Uh, but the Mist fans out there, I'm sure, are just going gaga over it. 
when I saw this. Yeah, I'm Googling right now where I can buy one. <laughs> When I saw this, I think you could do this much easier with a tablet, but I will give these guys credit for doing this. This is very difficult. They put a 1.6 gigahertz Atom processor in there, five inch touchscreen. I mean, this is a real computer in a book. It looks great. So good on you guys for putting that together. I, I'm just, I'm psyched. Oh, that. look at the little Windows XP launch screen inside <laughs> the book. That's so cute. What if it was 95? That would be even better. <laughs> Actually, it'd be closer you to to, to write, you know, because that's the <laughs> missed era. Yeah, they should have gone era appropriate. I guess XP is a little more stable, though, so that, that's probably a good choice. But uh, very cool stuff over there at Engadget. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. Let's uh, take another break. Thank our other sponsor for today's show, Gazelle. If you want the new iPhone before you get the new one, make sure you get your money for your old one. And, and let me tell you, the simplest way you're going to do it is go to gazelle.com. Use your gazelle.com to convert old gadgets into cash. Uh, G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Tell Gazelle the condition of your device. They'll even buy broken iPhones for cash. Get a risk-free offer for your gadget and lock that quote in for 30 days. You don't ha It's risk-free, so you don't even have to sell it. You just go lock in the quote because probably not going to get bigger over time. So do it today. And then you can take your time to find out what gadget you want to buy. Once you're ready, they, can, they give you a shipping label, so you ship it for free to Gazelle. Once they get it in, they'll email, say, hey, we're checking it out. They'll tell you, okay, we, we've verified the condition. We're going to send you your money. In a couple days, you get paid by PayPal or cash. What's your iPhone worth? Take a minute and go to gazelle.com to find out. Sell your used iPhone, iPad, MacBook, Android smartphone today at gazelle.com. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Let's take a gander at the calendar. You still have the calendar when you're at home, Sarah? Yeah, you know, it's amazing what the cloud can do for me. Thank you, Google. Yelp and LinkedIn have earnings reports tomorrow, November 1st. It's already November 1st tomorrow. Ah, everybody panic. NTD Docomo translation app is also launching tomorrow. It's going to get a lot of people excited, people who like translating things anyway. The LG Nexus 4 is hitting O2 in the UK on November 13th. And if you're interested in when you're going to have access to Grand Theft Auto 5, Rockstar says spring 2013. So you can hold your breath if you have a really good set of lungs, unless it gets delayed. You know what, Tom? I don't feel like your lungs are that strong. All right. Let's see what's incoming then. Incoming message. We've got electronic mail. Officer, yes. uh, officer email. Officer email. That, okay. We got an email from Andrew. This is, hey, TNT crew. I'm currently developing for Windows 8, getting in early. By default, all apps written in Visual Studio 2012 for the Windows 8 Metro environment, that, that was his word, are automatically compiled for Windows RT as well. Visual Studio doesn't ask you. It just compiles it for x86, x64, and ARM automatically. It isn't something you even need to think about. The only reason you'd go in and change the compilation settings is if you were doing something extra special in your app, which either use some special APIs that doesn't work on Windows RT, or for performance reasons, which is why games aren't available for RT yet, 99% of devs won't need to think about Windows 8 and RT separately. It's just one platform for them. For Windows Phone 8, you can reuse most of your Windows 8 slash RT code, redesign the UI for a smaller screen, maybe make some slight modifications to account for slight differences between Windows runtime and the Windows Phone runtime. They're very similar, but not identical, and you're good to go. Thanks, Andrew. That is really helpful because it's, it's trying to figure out exactly what's going on with Windows application development with these different platforms. Kind of takes a lot to get your head around it. Got another email from Derek Chen who says, in response to your discussion on retrieving news during Hurricane Sandy, once my power went out, Twitter was definitely the best way to get news for me. The websites of local news stations and national news sites were terrible. They were slow to update. Twitter provided crowdsourced updates real time. False info was quickly squashed and info from official agencies was quickly retweeted. Unfortunately, by the next day, cell reception was lost among blacked out areas, so I couldn't get onto Twitter or any site on my phone. Actually, the only thing I could connect to was the local news broadcast via digital FM radio on my Android phone. Boy, was I glad that my phone had that feature. He says, I'm emailing from a mate's flat in Astoria. Good to know. Thanks, Derek. Uh, and finally, got an email from Rob in Thornhill, Ontario, Canada. We were we were making fun of the can do and the fact that Canada is getting a phone first, and we called it can do. -da. He said you had a few laughs with can do in yesterday's show. Nuclear reactors in Canada are called 
can-do reactors, C-A-N-D-U. They were designed to use natural uranium, which Canada had in abundance, and the name is sh short for Canadian Deuterium Uranium. You can check it out at candu.org, C-A-N-D-U. Dot org. Uh, today, they could be called Canadian Nuclear Old Technology or Cannot Reactors since they've had some operational programs uh, problems over the, over the past few years. Thanks for that, Rob. Uh, so when we say can do, we're going nuclear. It's good to know. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Uh, Steve Kovac, thank you, man. It was great to have you along. Uh, great insights. Let folks know where they can find more of you online. Yeah, I'm the gadgets editor at Business Insider, so businessinsider.com slash SAI, and on Twitter, at Steve Kovac. And uh, if you want to come back on Tech News Today anytime, my friend, uh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. I you appreciate could, it. You can find us, uh, you can suggest stories for us at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Don't forget about that. You can also find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv, or give us a call, leave us phone mo voicemail message on the number that's with the phone at 260-TNT <laughs> show. I'm done. That's it. I'm out of here. Derek Colanduno joins us tomorrow. We'll see you there. Drop the mic. Ooh. I guess so.